2 Chronicles 8 1 to 9 31, through the Bible. Chapters 8 to 9. Theme, Accomplishments and Fame of Solomon. These next two chapters tell something of the experience and the work of Solomon and his testimony in other areas. This man became a very energetic ruler. He attempted to carry out all the plans and purposes and promises of David. And it came to pass at the end of twenty years, wherein Solomon had built the house of the Lord, and his own house, 2 Chronicles 8 1. This building of the temple was a long project. It actually took half his reign to build it. This is the thing of which God took special note. That the cities which Huram had restored to Solomon, Solomon built them, and caused the children of Israel to dwell there. And Solomon went to Hamath Zobah, and prevailed against it, 2 Chronicles 8 2-3. This is the only war that is recorded during the reign of Solomon, and it doesn't seem to be very significant at all. But of the children of Israel did Solomon make no servants for his work, but they were men of war, and chief of his captains, and captains of his chariots and horsemen, 2 Chronicles 8 9. Solomon put his own people in the army and in places of leadership, while the menial tasks were assigned to descendants of the Canaanite tribes, the old possessors of the land, who had not been exterminated. And these were the chief of King Solomon's officers, even 250, that bear rule over the people, 2 Chronicles 8 10. This is something that Solomon did which caused great difficulty later on. God notes it, but he does not commend it or bless it. And Solomon brought up the daughter of Pharaoh out of the city of David unto the house that he had built for her, for he said, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David king of Israel, because the places are holy, whereunto the ark of the Lord hath come, 2 Chronicles 8 11. This is an interesting decision which Solomon made in reference to his wife, the daughter of Pharaoh. He built her a palace away from the city of David. I notice that an interpretation that one gets in Israel today is that Solomon married these different women from various other countries for political advantage. Your father-in-law is not apt to make war against you. So this was one of the ways in which Solomon brought peace to the land. A man would not come up to fight against a country in which his daughter was the queen. I do not know whether this reason for Solomon's many wives is true or not. I have a notion that it is partly accurate. Under any circumstance, it was against God's command. The remainder of the chapter tells more about the temple and that Solomon celebrated the feasts and appointed the priests and Levites to their courses just as David had planned it. As we come to chapter 9, we see that it is the final chapter that concerns Solomon. We have seen that Solomon's most important accomplishment was the construction of the temple. Now what else in Solomon's life does God consider important enough to record a second time? It is very interesting to see that Solomon did succeed in doing what God had intended Israel to do, that is, be a witness to the world. We are told here how it was accomplished. The way Israel was to witness was different from the way the church is to witness in our day. Israel faced in, the church faces out. Israel was to go up to Jerusalem to the temple and invite the world to come with her to worship. But the church is to begin at Jerusalem and go to the ends of the earth. In other words, the church is to take the gospel to the world, and Israel was to invite the world to come and share in the revelation of God in the temple. Israel was to bear witness to the living and true God as a nation in a world of polytheism, of many gods. And the church is to bear witness to a resurrection, and the living Savior, as individuals to all the nations in a world of atheism. Now, Israel fulfilled her God-given purpose to a certain extent, which is evidenced by the number of Gentiles who came to Jerusalem to worship and to know God through the service of the temple there. The measuring rod for the success of the church is the number of tribes and nations to whom we carry the gospel today. Now it is the inclination of all of us who are in the church to disparage the efforts of Israel and at the same time to magnify the success of the church. Constantly we hear on every hand of the failure of the nation Israel. And at the same time the exaggerated report is given of the success of the gospel in faraway places. I remember after World War II we heard about a revival in China and then a revival in Germany. I checked with those who were in both places and they said there was no revival there. It is interesting that we always hear of revivals in faraway places. The fact of the matter is that we are in an awful apostasy today. The days are getting darker. There are many wonderful churches and pastors who are still faithful today, but they know the difficulty of the hour in which we are living. 
Although there are still a few preachers and teachers who are sheltered in institutions who see the present day situation as though they were looking through rose colored glasses, anyone who is working out in the world knows that we are in an apostasy today. On the other hand, Israel succeeded in a far greater measure than we often realize. We tend to measure their success by their final failure, the final apostasy of the nation which led to their captivity. There was a period when they did not fail God. A witness went forth from Jerusalem to the nations of the world. They were drawn to Jerusalem like a magnet. The high water mark was during the reign of Solomon. The nation reached a pinnacle at that time. Afterward there was deterioration, and decline set in like dry rot. The scriptures give us two isolated examples of the influence on the Gentiles during the reign of David and Solomon. Undoubtedly there were many others that we do not know about. Hiram, the king of Tyre and friend of David, came to know God. He made lavish gifts for the temple. He furnished material and workmen for the temple. Do you remember what he wrote to Solomon? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, that made heaven and earth, who hath given to David the king a wise son, 2 Chronicles 2 12. Hiram was a son of Japheth. The story of the Queen of Sheba is given to us to record that Israel reached the ends of the then known world with a witness for God. She is a representative of the sons of Ham. It is her story that is given to us in this chapter. May I remind you that in the New Testament, when we are told about the early church and its outreach into the world, we are also given just a few examples. There is the Ethiopian eunuch who is the son of Ham. There is Cornelius who is the son of Japheth. There is Saul of Tarsus who is the son of Shem. Visit of the Queen of Sheba. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem, with a very great company, and camels that bear spices, and gold in abundance, and precious stones, and when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions, and there was nothing hid from Solomon which he told her not, 2 Chronicles 9 1-2. In other words, Solomon told her the secret of his kingdom. He told her that God had given him his wisdom. He told her that the temple was their approach to God because God had said it was there he would meet with his people. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, his cupbearers also, and their apparel, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her, 2 Chronicles 9 3-4. In 1 Kings 10 24 we are told, and all the earth sought to Solomon, to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. We are given just this one illustration of the Queen of Sheba who came to see the wisdom of Solomon. You can see that the nation of Israel was successful in witnessing to the world. His ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord was the burnt offering which he made. That burnt offering speaks of Christ. No nation on earth had anything that would compare to an offering for sin. This was the thing which absolutely amazed her. This was the offering that was pointing to Christ. David had said and written so much about Christ that I don't think Solomon left her without an explanation of the one who was to come to take away sin. And she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in mine own land of thine acts, and of thy wisdom, howbeit I believed not their words, until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and, behold, the one half of the greatness of thy wisdom was not told me for thou exceedest the fame that I heard, 2 Chronicles 9 5-6. This woman said, when I heard about what God had done, I just didn't believe it. But she had faith enough so that when she heard about the greatness of Solomon, she made a long, arduous trip to see for herself. Believe me, it was a long, arduous trip in that day. She couldn't go out to the airport and take a plane which would bring her there in a couple of hours. It was probably a couple of months across a hot, burning desert. She came all the way in order that she might know something of the wisdom of this man and learn about his approach to God. That was the thing that left no spirit in her. She couldn't believe it until she had seen it. Now listen to her. Happy are thy men, and happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on his throne, to be king for the Lord thy God, because thy God loved Israel, to establish them forever, therefore made he thee king over them, to do judgment and justice, 2 Chronicles 9 7-8.
This woman is now praising God. When our Lord spoke of her, he said, The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, Matthew 12:42. There is a Sheba in southwestern Arabia and in Africa. Since the Lord Jesus said that she came from the uttermost parts of the earth, I assume she came from Africa. But her entourage reveals the wealth and luxury of the Orient. The wise men never made a greater impression than did this woman. She came with great pomp and ceremony befitting an Oriental monarch. It seems that the burnt offering was what impressed her the most. This was the most complete and perfect picture of Christ that was given in the Old Testament. How well did Israel succeed in giving a witness to the Gentiles? Well, this woman came to know the living and true God. Our Lord, you recall, one day spoke to a woman at a well and said, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem, worship the Father, John 4:21. In Jesus' day, that hour was coming. And that hour did come so that today we are to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. However, in Solomon's day, the world came to Jerusalem to hear the gospel. Solomon's splendor. And King Solomon passed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon, to hear his wisdom, that God had put in his heart, 2 Chronicles 9 22-23. Solomon was bearing a witness to the world in his day. And Solomon had four thousand stalls for horses and chariots, and twelve thousand horsemen whom he bestowed in the chariot cities, and with the king at Jerusalem, 2 Chronicles 9 25. This reveals the defect in this man's character. The king had been forbidden by the Mosaic law to multiply horses and wives. Solomon multiplied both. One of the most impressive things at Megiddo is the ruins of the stables that Solomon had there. And there are ruins of his stables in several other areas. He really multiplied horses. And he reigned over all the kings from the river even unto the land of the Philistines, and to the border of Egypt. And the king made silver in Jerusalem as stones, and cedar trees made he as the sycamore trees that are in the low plains in abundance. And they brought unto Solomon horses out of Egypt, and out of all lands, 2 Chronicles 9 26-28. Solomon was one of the great rulers of this world. Death of Solomon. Now the rest of the Acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet, and in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite, and in the visions of Edo the seer against Jeroboam the son of Nebat? And Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel forty years. And Solomon slept with his fathers, and he was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead, 2 Chronicles 9 29-31. God had fulfilled his promise to Solomon. He had given him supernatural wisdom for which he had asked, and in addition he had given him riches and wealth and honor. 